learning. So just um, that being said, I want to start off um, just by briefly saying that uh, the fort is on the lands of the Mississaugas, the Credit First Nation, right. and on the traditional lands of um, the traditional lands of the um, Mississauga and the Shinnebeg, Haudenosaunee, Wyandot Indigenous people. And uh, we have a lot to learn about in terms of gardening land and plants. And like indigenous people, we have concerns of the health and the vitality of the living earth. And we both celebrate gardening for beauty and sustenance. I have a lot more that I'm going to be adding to the, um, to the land acknowledgement because there's too, so much to say. And um, as time goes on, these things will be added. Uh, I mean, I can, you know, read something, but I like to speak from the heart as well. And I was impelled and uh, I was compelled to do so to this evening. Uh, once again, thanks everybody for joining this meeting. Um, and it's a Mary May meeting. And I wanted to mention that I have a very special video uh, that I have uh, put together and Clement will be queuing. I'm not sure if Clement's going with that one first, but uh, um, I went uh, by the um, St. George by the Grange, also known as St. George the Martyr Church, where we usually have our Mary May meeting. And I was, had a chance to uh, film some video of the garden. Mm. We have numero uno video billing. So we, when we get to that, you'll be number one. Any other announcements? Uh, yes, before we do the video, I was going to let the video play now. I was going to do the announcements, so I could do the announcements right now. Um, once again, if you um, are um, having renewed your membership, please do so. Uh, you can email us at uh, membership at parkdaletorontohort.com. For those who are interested in the plant show, which is happening on the 4th and 5th, you had to renew your membership as of the 28th. So I don't know what you're going to do in that situation, but um, yeah, definitely look forward to that. You receive, you receiving, those who renew their membership will be receiving uh, information about uh, your the way to get stuff picked up on the 1st of June. Am I correct in saying that, Clements, the 1st of June? Uh, we'll have Mika on in a few minutes and she'll just run through that list of details. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, another thing I want to mention, I, I was, I was, it took me a little while to come on here, but I just recently um, received something from the uh, Dundas Roncesvalles Peace Garden, and I just want to mention, read what was mentioned here. Uh, this is an invitation to anyone feeling moved to take part to honor the 215 unknown Kamloops residential school children who died and were buried unacknowledged, their parents not contacted, cause of death unknown, and to unfound thousands who did not go home from residential schools. The Dandas Roncesvalles Peace Garden allies with indigenous nations, artists, and groups by hosting a children's shoe memorial. Local individuals and families are invited to bring a pair of child shoes, slippers, or moccasins to the Peace Garden. Previously loved or new shoes will be warmly received. Each pair will remind us that every child lost is loved. Um, you may bring your offering at any time, but a volunteer will be present at the Peace Garden between 4 p.m. and 5 p.m. each day this week uh, from May the 31st, which is today, to June the 4th to welcome you. So just to mention that, uh, if you need more details, uh, you can go to the Facebook page or you can, I'm not sure if they're on, um, if they're on Twitter or Instagram, but I guess either Abby or or if just if Jesse's on there, they could probably mention what other means to, to contact for more information. Um, other than that, I don't have any more announcements. If there's anything else somebody people like to mention, they can, but I have no more announcements at this point. So thank you. Thank you. On the agenda. Um, I have Amika and the plant share group coming. And I'm not sure who wants to speak for them, um, but um, if I can ask who would like to speak about the uh, the plant share to join us now. Um, 
this would be the right time for that. Would that be you, Amika? Yep, that's me. Um, I This is going to be a very different sort of an event. <laughs> Not a plant fair, but a plant share. Uh, it's limited to members, as we've already said, and it's also going to be very controlled because we don't want hordes of people anywhere. We're going to be sending an email tomorrow. I need to get everything. Somebody's making a lot. Somebody's making a noise. If you can all. Um, so we're going to be sending members only a link or uh, sorry a, a bulletin tomorrow and that'll have a link to the website a special page on our website and on that website it'll give you instructions of how this will work you'll be able to browse a list of plants and plants will be listed by location but it'll be sort of a general location like dover core or something you won't know where those actual plants are until we have confirmed that those plants are still available. And behind the scenes, we've got a bunch of people that'll be putting your name beside that plant name. So it's become very, very detailed. Um, you will look at that list. You'll fill in a form that we will have. We will compile the orders behind the scenes and we will let you know that these plants are available. And if they're not, we'll let you know. Uh, we'll send you a doodle poll, which is something that will allow you to pick a time. And it'll be a unique time when nobody else, hopefully, will be around too much. There might be the odd person, but it'll be spreading everybody out during those two days that we have the plant share on. Uh, if you go and pick up plants, please bring your own box or bag to put them in. And you don't pay before you pay after, because maybe one of the plants that you ordered wasn't there. Or maybe one of the plants is a bit smaller than you thought and the recommended price, which is all we've done is recommended price, isn't quite right. So, or maybe you get the plant and you go, wow, this is way bigger. I'm going to pay a bit more for it. So just, we would pay afterwards and it's done as a donation on that web page also. Uh, so we'll let you know how things go and we'll be in communication with you, but there's a lot of sort of organization behind the scenes and we hope it goes well but thank you for your patience and understanding i'd Any like to thank yeah. amika for hard work on this amika do you want to rattle off a list of other people who've been helping i know annalise is oh yeah annalise and we have about eight different people that are hosting plants and more than that that donated plants so we some people are bringing plants over to other people's places so it's going to be interesting. We've got on count about 575 plants, which I think is pretty impressive. Uh, That's great. So um, I will mention somebody is eating dinner. That's good. I hope you're enjoying <laughs> dinner. Oh, sorry, Clement. I forgot to turn my set off. I will do that right now. Okay. How do you do that? How do you do that again? How do you turn it off? You scroll down towards the bottom of your screen and you'll see nice. the buttons at the bottom and one will say mute and you click on that. And if you don't want to be on the video, you would turn off your video. Yeah. Okay, great. So um, at this point, I'm going to share my screen and I'm going to bring up a PowerPoint in which I've tried to put most of the people who contacted us about wanting to be on. And if you didn't contact us or you, I missed you, well, we'll try and get to you towards the end. But uh, this is a way of me trying to keep this organized enough. So can everybody see Video Store? Yes. So you're nodding. OK. So um, for our Video Store, we're going to start off with Ron's video that he recorded this morning at St. George the Martyr. And then we'll go on to um, the recording that Eric Wilder didn't manage to put on the screen last time. And for these first two, I ask your pardon in advance, because I have to run them here on my computer and then get them over to you. So um, there's going to be a little bit of the usual technical nonsense while I try and work this all out. And then uh, Polly Wells was working 
on a video as well. And I understand it wasn't completed to her full satisfaction, but she might choose to put something up anyhow. So I'm going to stop sharing this screen. I will try and get my video of Ron running. And it's way down in the list. I get so many files from everyone and it's 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 fine but <laughs> like i have a hundred files in this folder oh all right i have a very handsome gentleman now i have to go back here and run you're to talk over this screen because you turned off the sound on it i did i have sound on mine that i sent i, I didn't hear sound on yours so um you may need to talk over it but there's your screen i'm going to start you and run your talking okay yeah oh. hi this is ron charlamagne president of the horticultural society's park in toronto i'm here outside of saint george by the grange also known as saint george the martyr a uh, church that we have heavily been involved with over many years uh, through our toronto port side so I'm here to welcome you all to the May meeting. This is where we usually have our May May meetings uh, every May. Uh, we haven't had one here in a while, but uh, thanks to the great people here at the church, I've been able to uh, do a quick video of the garden area. So enjoy. Pink Rose was planted in memory of somebody's uh, deceased father. Maria have been spectacular this week. Thank you so much, Ron, for making that recording. No problem. Um, I, it was great to be there again. And I've been in contact with um, Nadia Smurl, who is one of the directors there at the church. And um, she's mentioned to me, I've, I, did, I did message the board that uh, she's looking for some help this summer to, to, to maintain the grounds. So I know Heather and uh, Eduardo have uh, met her uh, to discuss uh, stuff. So. They definitely want us to to come back again this summer and do something with the church. So we'll see if we can get something together and um, and budget it for a, a grant possibly. So uh, we'll see what happens with that. Who's looking after it, Ron? Uh, right now, she told me pretty much she's been looking after it. And the ironic thing is that when I came today, I was supposed to go on Friday, but it rained and I wasn't able to make it. But she told me last week there was literally nothing in bloom or hardly anything in bloom. So my timing was perfect when I came to film it. So <laughs> she said she's pretty much been maintaining it, but she definitely said she need they need help. So 
Um, I mean, if anybody from the Horde has an interest to uh, to do stuff, you can contact her and, and make arrangements. And then if so be it, try to send in something for a, a grant proposal and see what happens. Well, Ron, thank you so much for doing that and for letting us know, because the last time I was down there two years ago, 2019, I, I got the distinct impression that the board, A, wasn't interested in supporting it anymore, and that B, um, I couldn't get any help. There, there was a fellow associated with the church named Brian, who was doing most of it, and, um, and I would go down occasionally. But, yeah. um, but I, I got the impression that we were sort of being shoved out of there by the church, that they weren't interested in, in having outsiders come in. Yeah, well, ironically, it's funny, when I uh, spoke to Natty on the phone, she mentioned both you and Eduardo, so uh, that was really great news, and definitely oh. she's interested with us uh, being involved with them again, so. I'll have to get her contact information for you. The last people I was in contact with was the secretary in the office, so thank yes. you. What I'll do is I will email you her, uh, her email and and phone contact. Yeah, great. Yeah. That would be great. Thank you. Um, I, can I say something too? Oh, yes, Eduardo. Hi, Eduardo. Uh, hi, everybody. Um, actually, I was touched, you know, by by this all this uh, uh, lovely pictures, uh, lovely video. Thank you for that, Ron. And uh, you know, that remind me. I I was there like for ten years. I at least, I don't know how many years, I did a lot there. And uh, I, and I don't know, I felt, I felt like I was kicked out from there. Mm -hmm. So, um, so I'm surprised that the one is back. Yeah. Yeah, it's really great so, news. Because I was, I was pleasantly surprised because my only intention was just to be able to go down there and film. And then when I had a ch chance to talk to Nadia after the fact of making the arrangements to go there to film the video, she mentioned that. So that was really great news. So I said, once we are able to talk and, and get a game plan, definitely she's open for discussion. Eduardo, so, I think that was a misunderstanding uh, due to a new person, the new caretaker who didn't know anything about our involvement and just wanted your belongings out of the tower because they were yeah. moving everything and, and sort of said, get your stuff out of here. And I think he might have misinterpreted that or he didn't know about us. So I really don't think it was the church that didn't want us. But that was a bit of a, a misunderstanding for a while. Uh -huh. uh -huh. But anyway, so it, I, I've got, you know, I was really touched about uh, the, the place. And uh, I'm actually, uh, even the gate was open, right? Yeah, actually, they... They opened, she opened the gate. I basically called her and she came down and opened it for me. So she told me just uh, call her when I arrive and yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, because I, you know, I didn't, I didn't have the keys of the door yeah. to, to, to uh, go in. So I don't know. It's like um, you couldn't just go in like I used to. So I'm, I'm really happy that, um, that, uh, you know, they just, to. Uh, there's a window of opportunity here, right? Very positive is, is it, story. Sorry? It's a very positive story. It is. Yes. Thank you, Ron. Thank you. No problem. Thank you. It's my Thank pleasure. Thank you. Ron, not everybody knows about the church. Could you just give us a little bit of the background? Okay, so to give a little bit of background of the church, um, our Toronto section of the Hort Society, which has been around a very long time, um, held their meetings at one point at that church. Um, and at one point, the Park on Hort Society, after merging, um, would hold their May meetings, our May meetings in that particular building. Um, and up to a couple of years ago, right, uh, because of the construction of the condo, which is now completed, um, was a little complex time because they, we were nobody was sure what was happening with the building or what was going on, um, so that left some complications. But we have been doing um, garden projects with the um, uh, Saint Saint George by the Saint George the Martyr, but now known Saint George by the Grange since 1992. That was the plaque that you saw at the end of the uh, the video. So we've been heavily involved with the church for so many years. 
So that's that's our connection to uh, the church. And perhaps there's an opportunity there for Heather and Eduardo and other people to think about the uh, 30th anniversary of that next year and perhaps do something. Exactly. The background is that the church uh, is an old building and people bought up the adjoining parking lot and then said, well, we're going to gouge it down to subterranean level 99. And by the way, the church may fall down, so you can't let anyone in. So the church very abruptly had to bar its grounds to all of the public. And during that rather abrupt period, all kinds of things went a little sideways. But we're glad to hear that it's, it's getting back and that it didn't fall down. <laughs> during the construction. All right, um, I am going to try now to put up the video from uh, Eric Wilder's company and uh, I'll see if I can make this part of the meeting work. Your screen, there we go. So this is a couple of minutes. Eric Wilder was our speaker. For all of our science and knowing, we have engineered wilderness and nature out of our daily lives. Our cities have eliminated biodiversity and allowed invasive species to proliferate. Our scarce green spaces are becoming wastelands. Yet, the solution to most of these problems is actually quite simple. <laughs> we need to rewild our surroundings with tree species that belong. Native trees are the most effective, least expensive nature-based climate solution on the planet. Indigenous trees restore biodiversity and ecosystem health. Healthy ecosystems promote happiness and well-being. Wilder delivers nature-based climate solutions that improve local biodiversity and enhance ecological and human resiliency. Join us. So that was uh, the very short video that uh, Eric Wilder's company has. And um, at this point, I'm going to try and share my screen again. And oh my, where is my, I wish it wouldn't randomly permute all the pieces. No, my phone doesn't get, any answer? Power up. <laughs> oh, gadgets, gadgets, isn't it wonderful? Um, PowerPoint, yes. So um, we were going to ask Polly if she has anything that she'd like to show. So Polly, would you like to show anything? I don't know if Polly is still here. Polly Wells, are you here? Sorry, I was on mute, talking to you on mute. <laughs> um, yes, if I can share the screen, I can show you my slideshow. All right, I've just made you a co-host, which allows okay. you to share your screen. I'll stop my sharing. So you should now be able to click in the corner of... Uh... Yeah, I will do that. I just want to make sure I have it in um full screen as well okay so hold on one second i need a minute to uh isn't technology wonderful <laughs> it's all what this how the order in which you do things unfortunately so i have to first share my screen so you'll see my messy sc screen for a minute and then i will go um Advanced sharing options, multiple. Uh, uh, what do I do? It says share screen, but it doesn't really give me the option to take it. One well, participant, shall I just push that? Is that me? Can you see my screen now? Um, not yet. So uh, okay. typically it will show you all the windows that are open on your desktop. And you click on one of those to choose the one that you're sharing. 
Yeah, I know that part, but am, are you even on my website, my desktop? Okay. Can you see my desktop? No. Well, there's that's the first problem we have to solve. Um, so what I would do is I would put your video up on your desktop, then share the screen, and then click on the video when you the share screen shows your multiple windows. Okay, it's it's not a video. I'm just showing you a slideshow. Okay, but, well, that's fine. Just show us your slideshow then. Okay, <laughs> the problem is when I make it full screen, I can't I can't control the Zoom share button, and I'm not sure I'm actually sharing it. I have had that problem too. So okay. rather than putting the slideshow into full screen, I just put the slideshow into normal mode. Um, and then you can still move back and forth into the Zoom thing. There's some kind of contention between Zoom and PowerPoint for control of your cursor, and it's okay. Let us hope that. Okay, can you see my? Can you see my garden? It's on my screen. Um, yeah, no, that's the problem. Um, Can you share screen yet? Yes, I've tried to share screen. I just didn't see a. Um, I didn't see anything that actually looked like what I'm used to when I share screen. Okay, my options are one participant can share at a time, multiple participants, maybe I have to click that one, sorry. Advanced sharing options, maybe it's that. I think you want to be out of advanced sharing options. I think you want to just do the simple share screen. Okay, but um, all right, so maybe I'm making it too complicated. Ah, I am. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. Yeah, I was looking at all the options and that was wrong. Okay. okay. So wow. here's what I'm going to show you um, once I get. No, not right now, sweetie. We can. We can... Uh, okay. We can see. All right. So I wanted to. Can you see it? Yes. Okay. So I wanted to quickly um, just talk about this is my house. We've lived here 16 years. This um, front yard, the other part, I have like four parts to my garden. This is the front part that um, I just was really upset with and wanted to fix. So this is what it looked like almost exactly a year ago. I had privet hedge everywhere. Like I had, I pulled out myself like 40 privet privets or like uh, wrestling the gorgons. Um, but I wanted to open up my yard, my garden. So this is what it looked like before. And I'll just quickly run through stuff and show you the different parts of my garden. And I also, as you, that's what it looks like now, oh, <laughs> a wow. year later. It's amazing. Wow. Um, but I had Privet Hedge running down. I'm on St. George and Admiral, the corner here. And the, to the right, that was all privet hedge. I had like 50 feet of privet hedge. And it was all really old privet hedge too. So I just wanted to show you the transformation of my garden because it's been fun for me. Oh God, so many problems. <laughs> um, okay, this is what my yard was. It was grass and hedge and you know a few beds. So I started, I wanted to make a curved path. So that's just, just a few little quick slides of what I did. And then I made zones before I had a gardener buy the plants for me and, and put help me put them in. But I created the zones where I wanted stuff and I had a pretty good idea. I knew what I wanted to put in. And then um, here's this, a little closer shot of the things I had. I, I really wanted this um, autumn moon shirawana sh something. Uh, it's a uh, Japanese maple on the left. I've forgotten the name. I'm sorry. It's an autumn moon is the variety. And pretty much everything in this bed, maybe 80% of what's in the bed was is new. So I put in a lot of plants last, last June. Um, so this is um, just some other shots of the garden early on. These are last summer. And um, I... Um, the, the second part of the garden I want to show you is you follow this backwards, you follow this path, you go to this side garden. I, another goal was to integrate um, vegetables into my ornamentals. So you can see a few attempts at that, which worked out pretty well. Um, 
So this is one of the key plants. It's a stewardia, Japanese stewardia. So that's a big, you know, thing I put in last summer. And that seems to be doing well. And this is a, a Nana European beach um, that's also doing well. And um, those are sort of the big things I did. Oh, we got another one. There's some spring flowers. This is my side yard and what it looked like maybe five years ago. So I've also been um, building that up over the years. I was not a gardener before I moved to Canada because I lived in apartments for 25 years. And then I had this yard and I stared at it for five years. And then I started trying to figure out what to do with it. And now I've taken the George Brown gardening design course. I'm all into gardening. So it's been a really exciting thing for me to become a gardener. Um, so this is the new, this is the side garden kind of fuller and, and you know, compared to that, let's put it that way. <laughs> and um, so it leads back to the back of the property. So here I have, I'll show you some close-ups. So we have a paper bark maple I put in three years ago. I have a espaliered apple on the left. Obviously this cut leaf maple is right in front of us. Two DeGroot cedar and lots of other stuff um, that changes every year. I kill off a lot of things. Um, and there's a Suga Cadienza in there. And a, 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 yeah, I, I wish I had my list. I wasn't, wasn't able to do everything I intended with this presentation. So I'm not as ready as I, I wanted to be. So this is, I put this, <laughs> I really wanted a focal point. I had, I inherited a house with a fence like this and this structure. So I had all this kind of hardscape and not very much in the beds. So my, and I love this sort of Asian look. And I was looking for something, a focal point um, down the path. And I realized this, this table, this metal table that was round that I didn't use that much in the garden. I realized I could turn it upside down and hang it on the wall. I'm quite happy with that. Um, I love not spending money. Um, so I don't know what you want to know, but that's a reverse view of the the side garden. This is the apple tree. There's the pipe of bark maple with a bunch of other stuff around. Oh, look, I have apples on the tree. These, some of these are from the past year, obviously, not just now. And I grow, I'm growing about eight or nine clematis, which is fun. Um, and just, you know, there's one of the clematis that actually will grow in the shade, which is what I need. Um, Campanula. This is the transition space from the side to the back. So as you can see, I have a lot of different things to garden and keep up with. This is my back garden, which is almost entirely shady. And um, this is my favorite place ever. <laughs> it's really wonderful. Um, whoops, I'm skipping ahead. I didn't take too enough pictures of my side garden, but I also had a goal to add um, vegetables. And the most sun I get on my entire property is this 18 inch deep bunch of uh, soil between the fence and St. George, which is like 30 feet. This is where the privet hedge was. So I last summer I built this um, box for a designated place for vegetables. And I, I grew my first tomatoes and I inter, inter grew them with uh, the Menarda last summer and another right around the corner from that last shot. Mm -hmm. So here's another example of me interweaving stuff into the ornamental front garden. Oh, that's an Algonquin maple. I, I mean, Algonquin pine, excuse me, um, in, in the back for center there, which is a, a really wonderful plant and kind of marks the, the the transition into the side garden. I'm kind of jumping around. This is my, this is the same, this is where the privet was on along St. George. So these are sort of fall pictures now, I guess. It's, it's a bit of a mess, this order, but um, these are just things that, yeah, that's a good shot of the, uh, the St. George, 30 feet on St. George. Um, more tomatoes growing with the Monarda. That's a later shot of the, that's sort of late, late, oh, that's September, I guess, when my harvest was biggest. And I'm growing uh, lettuce in this box under the uh, Manitoba maple where it's a little shady. And these are just kind of, that's another structural thing I inherited when we bought the house, which has been wonderful. 
And these are some fall pictures last fall. So uh, that's a Saskatoon in the far, far uh, part of the shot. And um, obviously oak leaf maple, I mean, oak leaf hydrangea and various other hydrangeas. Um, this is the um, autumn moon um, Japanese maple in the fall. And that's uh, a part of my garden. I, that's the back, that's mm -hmm. the rear. Just these are just some shots of little things. There's image in the, I like the, the four season uh, aspect. So, and there's another shot and that might be my last slide. Oh, there's a shot of the <laughs> St. George side. And you can see that's actually taken just a day or two ago. So my tomato plants aren't, aren't very high up, but uh, um, so it's really come together a lot in the last year. So I wanted to share that. <laughs> so, very nice. Beautiful. I think, I think uh, just some, I'll just show these little fast, fast. Oh, really nice. Yeah. Lovely. A lot of texture. A lot of work. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, a lot of work, but it makes me happy. So <laughs> do you get much theft of tomatoes and things? Do people steal them? <laughs> oh, well, they do, but I don't mind. I've met so many people because of this garden. Yeah. People talk to me constantly. It's unbelievable. And Love kids, it. kids come along and pick it. I mostly grow cherry tomatoes because I have most success. And I don't mind if people, kids picking them and nah. I mean, I figure what I'm not going to police my tomato plants and plants. It's just, you know, I'm lucky if I get a few <laughs> every week. So, but yes, I'm sure they do pick them. Right. Um, but it's been a huge, I mean, it's really connected me with the neighborhood and people appreciate that I did it because they think they like watching how it changes. And uh, so it's been very gratifying. Huge transformation. Uh, Okay. Holly, you've done an amazing job for um, someone who's a relatively new gardener. I'm really, really impressed. Oh, thank yeah, you. It's beautiful. It's really beautiful. The, the course at George Brown was fantastic. I had I loved every single class I took, so that was a big boon to me. I felt a lot more confident. So that's probably it for me. Unless anyone has a question, have, have, have you considered have you considered painting a, a, a yin yang sing, symbol on your round table oh, that's hanging? Oh, wow. uh, on oh the that's a, no, I have not. <laughs> it didn't occur to me. That's it would be a perfect yeah. <laughs> perfect addition. Yeah, it was hard to incorporate the Asian feel into the front garden. It I improved the front garden, obviously, but. Uh, it didn't bring in the Asian feel so much, but I think it still works pretty well. So, so uh, shall I stop sharing or did I do that already? Uh, <laughs> you should stop sharing uh, if you... I may not be. I don't think I am anymore. I, I see your screen now. So um, this is a um, little... Um, clip may be hard to read it's off of a Facebook page from our uh, September speaker Joseph, Joseph Pitawanicut um, and his partner Christy and their child have been um, putting hearts on the sidewalk for the 215 children who oh. Oh. Um, so it's uh, it's another kind of sharing and uh, it may be a way to bring something to your neighborhood if you know a kid. Oh, that's a good like idea. Yeah. Do this, you know, Abby. I don't know if uh, you and your group would like to do that, but uh, this is this is another way. All right. Well, we'll move along here. That is, I will try and move along. There we go. Um, we heard from Amika about the uh, the plant share. And as you know, it's coming up at the end of this week. And these are some pictures just from my garden of plants that will be available in the plant share. So I've just talked you through it. These are 
four or five seedling agapanthus. I have blue and white agapanthus, and they bloomed, and one of them set seeds, which I saved. And so this is the second year for these seedlings, so they've grown to a bigger size. Uh, who knows what the color will be? Will it be blue or white? I suspect it'll be blue. I've been growing a number of native plants that'll be listed. I've divided my thornless blackberry, which is blooming right now. <clears throat> Someone kindly donated a Kentucky coffee tree to Project Swallowtail, which is now almost three feet tall, and I, it needs a good home because, as you'll see in a moment, my garden is full of trees. And I got a set of seeds from my native hibiscus, the one with the great big flowers. And I was able to sprout them this winter and grow them up. And it's a cultivar, the one that I, I got the seeds from, that has purple leaves. And you can see that that trait has come partly true in the seedlings. So I'll be having some of those. So those are some of the things that I'm contributing. I know many of you are contributing plants. So Helen. Uh, tell us about this. Uh, this is Helen, some of the plants from Helen Vorsters, and I think Helen's got maybe the largest plant that's being shared. Wow. Are you there, Helen? Well, if she's if she's not. I'll okay, I'm here. Oh, great. Okay. I am here. I was just muted. Um, well, that tall fellow is a uh, pagoda dogwood, and the parent tree is in the front yard, and it's. Um, quite mature now. I think it's about 30 years old. So whether these are seedlings or sprung from the roots, I'm not sure, but they're relatively easy to dig up and they're proliferating. So I need to get rid of them. Um, and this one is, is about seven feet tall. So it's ready to become a tree in someone's garden. And it it never wilted. I just transplanted it a few days ago and it's fine. I was surprised. I thought it would droop, but it didn't. And then lower down, there's another one in the pot just behind it, which is also a dogwood, pagoda dogwood. And it's only about two feet tall and maybe three feet wide. And it's just lovely. It's actually got really nice branching. So it will be a shrub for people until it takes off and then it will it will be a tree one day too. Um, and then how large do they get, Helen? How tall do they grow? Uh, I think it's 20 or 30 feet. Somewhere in that neighborhood. But that's it. They do not get bigger. They are a small woodland edge tree. And they can be pruned. I find it's hard to prune them because they want to be going out like uh, horizontal branching. So I'll just but, add in after Polly's comments about the Asian component to her garden's design. Um, Pagoda dogwood has that beautiful sideways branching structure that we see in some Asian um, trees. And uh, it makes a very nice structural statement in the garden. It also bears berries in abundance in August or early September, and the birds come in their hordes to eat those berries. So if you have the space, a lovely thing. Does that require part, part shade, though, to thrive? Um, it's part shade where it's growing now. So I yes, I yeah. think it does. I don't know if it would like full, full sun. Yeah. I have one in, it's wonderful, covered with blossom at the moment, and it's more or less in full shade. It probably gets a bit of morning sun, and it's been doing very well. I think it's one that's self-seeded from the ravine. But the one snag is raccoons climbing up and eating the berries and breaking the bones. Oh, oh. oh I've never, I've had squirrels sit and eat in the branches. I've never had a raccoon climb up in there. Helen, can you tell us what else you've got? Uh, I see two pots at the bottom of the right-hand panel. Those are flocks. Um, this is embarrassing. I think they're a two-tone pink. There's a chance, though, that they're white, because I had some from my mother-in-law, which were pure white. 
Um, but I think these ones are pink and they're a pretty two, two shade of pink. So those two are flocks, the two together. And then to the, to the right is an ornamental rhubarb. Um, I haven't bothered to look up the Latin name, but that one wants a big space. It's a beautiful, uh, demanding plant. Um, those leaves are just little. Uh, the, the parent plant has leaves about two feet or even two and a half feet wide and long. So it sends up really big leaves. And then in June, it'll send up a central stalk, a flowering stalk. That's quite nice too, if it gets enough sun. Unfortunately, it likes moist soil and mm, semi-sun or sun. So I've been growing it in shade and it doesn't bloom a lot. But it's, it's a fun plant to try and grow if you've got the space for it and the conditions. Great. And then the other one is, that's the, that's the dogwood, the little, um, Pagoda dogwood in the back there. Same guy. Well, thank you for those donations, Helen. I do say that we're not telling you all the details today. Paid up members will get an email probably late tomorrow because we're all struggling to get this done that will give you many more details and we'll direct you to web pages where you can find out who's got what. So that's coming. And I'm not sure if Louisa Montero is here. Uh, is Louisa on? I can't tell. No. No. Okay. So Louisa is donating some seedlings. And uh, these are images of the, the uh, what they make. So there's a, um, a heritage tomato variety. And I haven't seen the seedlings. I don't know how big they are. And I think it was called Sicilian striped gourd. To my, uh, Sicilian striped eggplant. Eggplant, I'm sorry, yes. And then there was the um, the long, uh, I think of it as an Asian gourd. Is long that gourd, yeah. Long gourd, yeah, it's an Asian gourd. Yeah, I saw one of those. Um, down south of Dundas Street in an arbor, just like this is. Yes. I'm just amazed at how big they can be grown here yeah. in the city. So there's some seedlings coming from Louisa. Yeah, she has lots of different tomato seedlings. She's got about a hundred different plants uh, of like two or three of every variety. It's amazing. Amazing. Okay. Well, we already heard from Ron. I was putting together these slides very quickly. Um, uh, Bill, are you still there? <laughs> Bill Chang, going once, <laughs> going twice. Yes, I'm here. All right, <laughs> show, us, show us a picture of your, uh, your garden, Bill. Uh, oh, where I have to go outside. Okay. How Bill, do I do this? Bill's moved from a house to a condo. So like many people, he's dealing with that transition from open garden to balcony garden. Okay, I'm up. All right. I'm in the garden. Okay. I have to see if I can see you, Bill. I don't know where you are. There. Um, Beautiful. Can you close your shared screen, Clement? And then- How do I do this? Uh, yeah. Can you pin, pin him? Yeah, yep. so where's That's Bill? Great. I'm trying to find him on my screen. <sighs> He's the guy moving around. <laughs> there he is. I'm going to pin you, Bill. I hope it doesn't yeah. move. So this is my street. Nice. And this is the garden. Little <laughs> one. Looks good. Hey. You got in it. Show us what you got up close. Show us the plant. Ah. Oh. I don't know if okay. you get it. Yeah. So what have you got so far? In my garden? Yes. yes. Oh, so I have strawberry in a pot. I have um, basil. I have um, chives. I have mint. I have a clematis. 
and I have some hostel and I have a big fern I took from somebody else and some violet, that's it. Most of them are from my old garden. Right. Okay. Well, many of you who know Bill know that he likes to cook. And so we were talking about his balcony, which faces west, but the sun is blocked until, what did you say, about two in the afternoon, Bill? Yeah. Two so, to, uh, let's look at the chicken dinner. <laughs> <laughs> so we were discussing which herbs for the kitchen would go well on a fifth floor balcony that gets hot sun from 2 p.m. onwards, but not before. Yeah. Anybody want to chime in with some suggestions? Yeah. Or well, anybody have actually have some little plan that can give it to me and I can try them. My favorite is savory with chicken. It grows well. Uh, Oregano is also great. And um, the best thing about them is to lift up the skin with your finger. You probably do that, Bill. Yeah. And uh, insert uh, the fresh herbs with a bit of oil, garlic, between the skin and the, uh, the flesh. But savory alone, if you have only room for one herb, oh, savory. And I think Colette has some at Urban Harvest. You might want to give a call first to see. Or um, ask me, I'm going there the next couple of days. If you're interested, I'll check to see for you if she has any. Okay. Are you interested? Um, mint? I, I grow the mint is for my mint heat. and chip. This is for the drink, my heat of cocktail. So it's not. Uh, tell me if it's good, I'll try it. Sage, sage would go very well. Sage could... too, okay. Sage and one thing. But I... I'm uh, the savory hunter. Oh. One, one thing I like are um, tree onions or Egyptian onions. And they have little onions at the top and they keep on going. And I'm not sure how it would be on a balcony, but I find that you can go and sort of dig in the snow and find a shoot or two um, mm. if you want a, a bit of green for a, a putting on top Good for Chinese meals. So are those little baby onions? So this, this one grows about half a meter tall, doesn't wow. have flowers, it has little tiny onions at the top of the stem and they fall off and grow to new ones. Oh, okay. So it's known as an Egyptian or a tree onion. Okay. I, I have and I think thyme is still. Thyme is a very sturdy plant that would probably do well in that much fun, I would think. Because I will make uh, pickle them and I make them into uh, Gin. <laughs> yeah, there we go. Dirty Time. gin. Dirty Time. martini. Dirty martini. That's what they call it. With uh, pickle onions. Little baby. That's dirty. So I'm a... Uh, so you can't tell me all this little thing. So I became a drinker. <laughs> Alcoholic. Good. Well, thank you, Bill. And it was nice okay. to see the beginnings of your new garden. And I hope that next May we'll see a big garden there. As yeah, you... and I'm looking for an indoor plant too because I get a big window here, so. Great. Yeah. Okay. Great, okay, so. And what we're gonna do now, if I can persuade the uh, screen to do so, yeah, there we go. We have, um, whoops, and my PowerPoint is getting away from me. Is Anne available to talk about her slides? Anne Karpinchik. Yes, I am. Um, basically, the uh, plant on the left was covered with the, um, well, the green covers you can see. What it is, it's at the church garden. 
And there are peonies from my mom that are very old, but a client that I work for and she does the, the meal program at the church, Maria, had um, at her house, she had a tree peony that never bloomed because it was in the shade. So I planted it behind my mom's peony because that was the only space that was available. I and mean, I didn't know if it was going to actually survive, but it did. And it never bloomed. And then this year, I saw two blooms and then the frost was coming. So I ran over and I covered everything. And then you'll see in the next slide, the, the it's a beautiful, beautiful bloom. So I was really, really happy about that uh, she got to see that in the garden. And then on the right, just the Dootsie, it was just a close up shot of the, the Yuki cherry blossom. That's so beautiful. And um, yeah, I just, I loved it. So that's uh, the, the tell, what tell I submitted. Which church it is for those who aren't familiar. Sorry, what's that, Clement? Which church is it? Oh, yes, it's the Roncesvalles United Church on Roncesvalles and Wright across from the High Park Library. And it started as a garden on Roncy proper. And then it grew onto Wright Avenue. And then it grew more onto Wright Avenue and then a little bit more near the spigot, um, the water spigot. And then on Roncesvalles proper again, to the right of the stairs, there's a little bit of a garden. And then there's a little bit of a garden in the parking lot. So yes, it's kind of, it's expanded a lot. Great, so next slide, there we go. So yeah, so you can see on the left, the, um, the peony and the tree peony after it being covered. And then the slide on the right, you can see what the tree peony looked like and it's absolutely gorgeous. And, and I was at the garden centers today and I just about died when I saw the tree peonies for like, some of them were like $130 for a plant. I'm like, wow. Yeah, and I'm, I'm still looking for the truly single tree peonies. I, I've seen them at the Royal Botanical Gardens, but I have bought them when they were labeled as such and they weren't. So oh. it seems to be a bit of a, a guessing game. Mm-hmm. In the meantime, you can just pick up all the extra uh, blooms, um, petals, Clement. <laughs> <laughs> Elin, please uh, tell us about your pictures, which went in a somewhat random order. I apologize, but there they that, are. That's, that's fine. I, I called it sort of a, a palette of pink and purple because I'm just struck by these spring um, sort of Monet color mm -hmm. combinations though on the left you'll see in our pond the irises have just opened and of course they add a splash of yellow but there are purple trade escantia that have opened um, that are below them and of course on the right is the salvia and the, these tulips I had with these I don't know what they're called but they're just stunning with the white with this faint faint purple sort of uh, stripe on them and then these pointy petals I thought were really I don't know where they came from but they they, they were fun so they, they they cut the 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 grade to and they they made it into the purple category so um, mm -hmm. that that's from my garden I also manage and plan and have been given the gift from my son and daughter-in-law to do their garden as well in the front which was really all grass two years ago when they moved in other than spirea that were overhanging by about 10 feet <laughs> so um this is the, I, I created a, a front corner bed. And as Polly was saying, it's amazing having a corner, you know, lot and uh, being exposed, the, the people, the conversations, the, it's just, it's just such a gift to have. So this year, I, I don't know what I planted last fall, those little purple bulbs came up but obviously the the forget me not and then I've got the um you know the sweet William but I don't know what those little purple flowers are <laughs> I'm sorry uh, anyway carry on the next one what have we got more purple and pink um yeah so the aqua legia obviously are all out in full force right now and um the allium so the question on the right is do you see the two bees the uh, oh. in the bottom there's an obvious one but in that top circle there there's actually a honeybee that's sort of camouflaged a bit it's sort of in the bottom left corner there but uh anyway they're they're great so obviously i, I do have a question here for anybody uh we have 
far too many alliums. Um, and so we, we cut big bunches and bring them indoors. And I've noticed that rather than an onion scent, they actually give off a very nice faint fragrance, but I seem to need to have it in a still place because it's not strong enough when it's windy outside. Yeah. Up. Yeah, definitely no onion flavors that that I can smell. And my um, what I learned this year too is that they they grow in total shade. I have them growing yeah. under my elderberry. <laughs> like they don't need sun. It just uh, they seem to be everywhere and multiplying definitely. I think as you'll see in the next slide, this is in my front garden. Uh, what no variety one. is it? Sorry. What variety of allium is it that thrives? In the I, I'm sorry, I can't help you with that. But the the tulips were really fun to have that dark purple with the pinks. And uh, then there was some phlox that came out again. So the next slide, and there you'll see there's a peony come there. Those are my allium on the left there in my front. Wow. I've got at least two dozen. Wow. And then um, Spencer, you'll correct me if I'm wrong on the bottom there, the bluebells. What bluebells are those? I think they're the English bluebells. They, they look more like the Spanish bluebells because the English ones hang very down and some of those are pointing up. Oh, okay. So and right. the, the Spanish ones are much easier to grow and more oh, vigorous. Yeah, Spencer sent me an article last year on it, but uh, obviously the irises and our rhodos are just opening up together with the meadow rue as the, of course, bleeding hearts are starting to fade now in the background. But uh, otherwise, all the wild phlox is now in full bloom in the <coughs> garden and uh, just had our deck repainted. So <laughs> sort of fit right in <laughs> but i've never grown rotos because i've never had a uh, permissive soil and i wasn't willing to go to the great lengths what's your soil like that uh, they are um you know what it's at the back of the garden and all i can tell you is for the last 20 years we have just been piling pine cones on Perfect. it from from the cottage, Maxine, then we'll gather pine cones and we she'd always bring them home for the rodo and we just throw them there. Uh -huh. um, the as I said, the meadow rue is very happy back there and the bleeding heart, it's it's quite shady. And those of you who are near High Park, the, the Rhododendron Society put a rhododendron garden on the east uh, east slope of Grenadier Pond. Uh, and it's an interesting place to go and see varieties in bloom. Oh, lovely. Yeah, well, that's it. now you. I'm I'm going to go and as the uh, techno geek here, I I get the chance to talk about my garden, and um, as a form of acknowledgement, I wrote this: as we plant our corn, beans, pumpkin, and squash. As our tomatoes and potatoes grow, the peppers and tobacco know that marigolds and zinnias, sunflowers and tigridias, dahlias and petunias, and chocolatel and vanilla were bred here in Turtle Island. We acknowledge those who bred and breed fruit and flowers, vegetables and seed. So that's wonderful. That's Lovely. response from me. Um, and I know Abby and others are, are well aware of this, but you know, if we go out in our gardens, look around, do a little research and discover how many of these were actually selected from the wild by the inhabitants of Turtle Island before European settlers came. Uh, and uh, if you're interested, you can look um, online. There are sparse records from the Spanish conquerors of the gardens of the Aztecs. The Aztecs were fanatical gardeners. They had amazing gardens. And so many of the plants listed here were domesticated by the Aztecs or by their predecessors. And uh, Unfortunately, the, the Spaniards destroyed most of the records of that, but there is a whole history there. 
you know, where did we get those giant double dahlias? You think, well, maybe Europeans took a single dahlia from Mexico. Into it. No, no, no. They were all double and big in the Aztec gardens. Hmm. No. So that's a comment. And now I'm going to talk a little bit about my garden. My garden suffers from trees. <laughs> my garden used to be very sunny. But soon after we moved in, I planted a small red bud that I got from the Royal Botanical Gardens. And here it is this year blooming. And it completely shades the front garden. So as other people have pointed out, I have to you know, make do with plants that can bloom before the shades. I've got lots of self-seeded allium underneath the red bud. And they will go dormant just as the red bud seeds begin to, uh, red bud leaves begin to come out. So any of your spring bulbs will survive that. In my back garden, not actually on my lot, but hanging over it, is one of the biggest elm trees in Toronto. So I'm always in awe that elm trees have survived in Toronto. And this is what the seed heads looked like about a week and a half ago on the elm. Oh, wow. um, very interesting. I looked up at the tree and I said, that tree looks like it's in bloom. And I zoomed in. And the seed heads have this whitish color before they ripen and darken to a gray brown. And one of the things that that brought oh. was many visitors. So even though this elm tree shades the best part of my garden, on some weeks in the spring, I can't object too much to it. And elms are one of the best providers of food to birds and bird nestlings. Are those you happen to know what that bird was, Clement? The cedar waxwing. The cedar waxwing. Yeah. And who can name this? The rhizome. It's the rhizome. An oriole. Tanager and an orchard oriole. That's correct. Thank you. Um, and so Orioles actually do like the pendant branches of elms. And I've been, one year I had one nest in that elm and I've been trying ever since. We'll get to my water feature in a little while. I had one visit for three or four days, but my offerings of cut oranges weren't quite enough. So uh -huh. uh, didn't make it this year. And oh, for the, beautiful. For the warbler fans in the group, you can identify this, but if you have a big tree, you can either grump about the shade it gives you or get out your binoculars or telephoto and enjoy it. <laughs> um, of course, it wasn't just the trees on my neighbor's properties. I did it to myself. I planted apples and many other things and they're wonderful. And I've pruned the apple tree to be very spreading. And uh, underneath it, is the bird feeder. Um, the birds do not like to be out in the open because then they're seen by the hawks and so on. So the, the feeder sits underneath the spreading branches of the apple tree. And this makes the cardinals, who I find are very cautious feeders, quite happy because they can perch in the tree and then come down to the feeder. Now, this is another tree that I've been, you know, this is me doing it to myself. Um, this is a pawpaw blooming in my garden today. And you see the uh, the fly over there on the right. Pawpaws have slightly unpleasant flowers and you see that sort of roughly rotten meat color. That's that's what a pawpaw's pollination syndrome is. It, it likes to be pollinated by flies that are attracted to carrion. But thanks to Ann Freeman, who manages the Dufferin Grove Farmer's Market, some years ago, I managed to get two unrelated pawpaws. And I cross-pollinated between them last year, and squirrels got the few pawpaws that grew. This year, many more flowers bloom. So I'm hoping that soon I will have pawpaw fruit, which is delicious. I know I've had it in Virginia. Um, as a garden plant, please note, will grow to 20 to 30 feet tall and sends out many runners. So you have to be willing to 
pull out your clippers and clip off the runners. But in the plant sale, there will be one full-size pawpaw seedling, two, three years old, I think, for those of you who want to do that. Now, as some of you know, I've been involved in Project Swallowtail trying to bring in native trees from southwestern Ontario that now survive easily in Toronto. Um, three years ago, I brought in a single hop tree. This is not poison ivy. These are hop tree seedlings. The hop tree has seeds on it. I grew them last year. And so these are the seedlings a year on, and some of them will be in the plant share. So um, second year hop tree seedlings. And why would you grow hop trees? Because the giant swallowtails caterpillar eats hop tree leaves. And I talked to, you know, one of the uh, Dwayne of Native Plant Gardening's Lorraine Johnson, who years ago lived in my neighborhood. And she says there's a 19 year old hop tree that she planted in her former house there that's still very healthy. So even though the books say the hop tree is not hardy here, they're wrong. How big does it get? Well, 20 to 30 feet tall. So, How do you spell? Is it H O P? I don't know the tree. H O P dash T R E E. Um, the Latin <laughs> oh. is Petelia, P T E L E A. Oh. Um, however, I have seen it growing on the shores of Lake Erie much shorter than that. So I think if it has a bit more sun, you can lop it off at eight to 10 feet and it'll be perfectly happy. The ones I saw were growing in sand on the shore of Lake Erie and they were not that tall at all. In the garden when we arrived was a lovely old fashioned pear tree. And unfortunately with the arrival of pear blister rust, this tree has been slowly dying, but it's full of hollows and it supports many families of squirrels, raccoons and other things. And I've been cutting limbs off as they die, but we still get a variety of uh, residents in the old pear tree. I think it'll be gone next year, but that's okay. I planted a catalpa, a hop tree, a spice bush, and a red bud in the areas that it used to shade. So there'll be some follow on. And uh, there's another one of our visitors in the Cobus magnolia that I grew from seed, which is next to that row of trees. What is it? Well, that was uh, Blackburnian. Yeah, thank you. And what? Black Vibernian? Blackburnian warbler. Oh, and, looks like it. And this is, I believe, an oriole. Looks um, like it. And so I've put, uh, you know, those suet feeders, the little metal cages that you get. Um, I slice oranges and put them next to the pond in the hopes of keeping the Orioles. And so far, not, not successful this year, but I'll keep trying. One year they stayed and nested. So you put sliced oranges out, did you say? or? A... I, I do that. Um, uh -huh. you could on the branches or, or on the bird feeder? In, in the suet feeder, which keeps the squirrels. Oh, the suet no, feeder. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, now, moving from trees oh. to the next level down, of course, I've got a, a tree peony or two, and they've been wonderful, but it's a brief indulgence, so you mm -hmm. have to enjoy them for what yeah. they are. This whole area at the back of my property has got a small pond, which we dug out and lined and, and put into place, but Looking at maps from 1855, there was a stream in the neighborhood. So I feel like I've just brought the water back. This is an April reflecting the, the daffodils on the far side of the pond. And uh, I've got marsh marigold on the right and the iris with the purple in the early foliage is, is Gerald Darby, which is an accidental hybrid between Iris versicolor, native to Ontario, and Iris virginica. 
but it looks very much like the parents. And, you know, it's always nice to extend your season. So we enjoy from the beginning of its growing um, in April till about now when the um, leaves start to turn mostly green, the foliage, and then the stems come up and they're that same purple. And the marsh marigolds are planted with a background of red leaved um, a still be behind them. What and is the iris, uh, Clement? Which type is that? This is iris X versicolor Gerald Darby. So there Gerald it is. Darby. Okay, thank but you. Iris versicolor is a, a wonderful plant, but it doesn't have the same leaf colors that I'm aware of. So there it is. And um, next to the pond is an area that I dug out and put peat and sulfur in. And it's got a liner under it as well, and it's moist. And I've got things like the jack in the pulpit and oh. our woodland flux, which is quite happy there and has begun to run, which makes me very happy because the woodland flocks will cover space if it's happy. It likes it moist, pe peaty? And well, moist. I don't know if it needs the moisture, but it seems to be happy in that. Okay. This is part of that bug garden. And here we've got wood puppy and dodecathean shooting stars and some of the usual violets and more wood poppy. So these plants don't absolutely require the bog conditions, but I've had wood poppy elsewhere in my garden and they bloom once like a tulip and that's it. And here in the wetter, more acid soil, they bloom again. So that's nice to know. So is that what you created uh, in, that, in that area is a more acid environment? Yeah, so not clear after a number of years how acid it still is, but the main thing is that it retains moisture. So it's a wet, boggy soil. For those of you who knew Barry Parker, he created a bog in his backyard as well, and he could grow a bunch of things there that he couldn't grow elsewhere. This is, let, let, let me just get, Anna Leggett, wait a moment. I'm sure you know. Anyone else know what this plant is? Angelica? No. No, right, right there. Cold parsley. So this is golden great. Alexander. Great, golden Alexander's. Oh, yeah, it's easier. And I put it elsewhere in my garden where it was very unhappy. I moved it to the bog garden, and it's very happy. So I'm growing it there because the leaves, since it's in the carrot family are one of the ones that black swallowtail caterpillars can live on, but the flowers are a pleasant May bonus. And then in my front yard, in one of the last little bits of sunlight that the red bud has not yet stolen away, I have some of the Turkish um, iris halophila. Years ago, I was a member of the Canadian Iris Society and I collected interesting, um, I would call them, Middle Eastern irises, and, and some of them are quite beautiful for the short time that they bloom. So I'm about finished. I'm just going to take you briefly through my um, shady border. This is a border that's got a fence to the south, a six foot fence, and it's got two trees on top of it. But there's a brief period in April and May when the sun gets over the fence and the trees haven't yet come out and I can grow all kinds of things. And it's, it, it's just the apple of my eye during that time. You can see hellebores and apomedium and uh, a variety of other things growing in there. So there's, it's, it's quite a joy. And I look forward to a year when I can have you all over hmm. in early May to just sit and look at this border because it's, it's quite wonderful. Hmm. Um, that's a Pomeria in the background and the the west coast um, relative of our dog tooth violet or our trout lily in the foreground. And there are two of the epimediums that are in the shadier part of the, the border. 
and epimediums, as you all probably know, they, they give you pleasant flowers in the spring, but then they make a wonderful ground cover of interesting foliage, which lasts almost all the way through the winter. So they're, they're almost a 12 months of the year plant. And I saw a fuzzy picture, but on my uh, Prestonian lilac, I had a black swallowtail um, this spring, and I'm hoping that either the parsley, the dill, the fennel, or the golden alexanders that I've planted met her uh, approval and that maybe I'll have caterpillars this year. And uh, up on my deck, I started seeds last fall. I got the seeds from um, Sutton Seeds in England um, to get truly scented sweet peas because most of the sweet peas we have are bred for size and color, not for scent. But these sweet peas really do have a good scent. And I, I grow them as biennials. I start them in September or October. I put them into my cold greenhouse. I bring them out in April. And then they give me two months of nasal pleasure. <laughs> and there on the right is Camasia and some Lunaria growing in my garden. And I'm just about finished here. I'm going to remind you that the plant share will have many plants and seedlings, some for me, some from others. And I think that finishes it for me. So is wow. there anybody else who wants to um, contribute? Over to you, and it's almost nine o'clock, so we can always close if nobody else wants to come on board. But if you want to tell us about some wonderful plant in your garden, please do so. No, I flummoxed you all. No, oh. I have one, it's Hildy. I have one that I got last year and I, as a seedling from a friend two seedlings he planted and gave them to me and they were a, it's a vine uh in the morning glory family but you would never guess it if you saw it in bloom it's called uh, ipomea lobata the common mm. name is mina lobata lovely plant yeah have, do you know it clement i usually treat it as an annual and grow it from seeds yeah that's what i did too so this year i have a few that i'm gonna they're now i keep cutting the the vine back because it's shooting out but i keep cutting it back because i have limited space in my apartment i've created a little um silver foil enclosure for to grow them in because i only get eastern light so this mm. gives the reflected light and they're doing well um, so to, just to say that, uh, I, I've just been too busy to really focus on the plant fair, but I was going to contribute a couple of those and, um, I'm not sure I'll get around to it, but the other thing I have for the plant fair is extra pots. Does anybody need any? <laughs> like four inch pots, six inch pots? No, it's too late now. Yeah, I know. I, I'm sorry about that. That's just, okay. Like, I would like to chime in after Hilda on the, the Mina Lobata and its relatives. There's a large number of morning glory plants that are native to um, South and Central America. Um, and um, you get um, two of them that are very attractive to hummingbirds because they're dark red, they have a tubular throat, they grow from seeds um, and it's a, a little bit of a challenge in our climate because they really want to be warmer. So if you started them in March indoors and put them outside in May, that would be perfect. And then you would get flowers in July or August. I went up um, on a tour that a few of you were at to the, um, or what was the old airport in mid Northern Toronto the Downs view, view. and I, I looked at one of the gardens there and, and somebody had planted the the cypress vine along there and then they just had a glorious thicket of it growing over the other plant. Wow. Mm -hmm. um, 
and I saw somebody in my neighborhood who had um, window boxes hung on her fence and she'd started these seedlings early, but unfortunately she put them out in early May. Mm. They, uh, the Too cold. fluctuating temperatures got them, so I, they're not very happy. But if you come upon them, the one I particularly like is called Cypress Vine. And it has very dissected leaves. So the leaves themselves are beautiful. And mm -hmm. it's mm -hmm. not too late. Uh, if you're going to plant them, soak them for a day or two before planting mm -hmm. them. You know, warm temperatures, maybe you'll get some beautiful flowers and hummingbirds. And if, if you, for next year, if you belong to the Ontario Rock Garden and Hearty Plant Society, they usually have seeds of those in the seed exchange in December. Oh. So you can order seeds and then start them in, get them in January and start them in March. The most fun, most amazing morning glory I've ever seen is a tree morning glory. It was about five meters tall or so with big white morning glory flowers. That was in Mexico. <laughs> um, Anna, thank you for that. And there, there's huge scope if, if you actually want to go further on that. There are morning glories that have big tuberous roots. And um, I believe that there's one variety that is hardy as far north as Southern Ohio. Um, I don't know anything about the flowers. Native people used to dig up the tubers and use them as food after a fair number mm. of boilings because I think it's mm. obnoxious otherwise. But um, Anna, what other unusual vines like that would we have to join the Rock Garden Society to find out about? <laughs> I will mention the, um, the climbing nasturtium which apparently is, is a, a fair trick to grow. I only see it growing at Kew and a few other places that um, can climb to 10 feet tall and is perennial in a mild climate. Um, and I've always wanted to grow that, but I don't think it enjoys hot, humid summers. You, that's the red one? Yes. Yes, I, oh, I know it was a weed in my uncle's garden in England. Um, <sighs> I've, I tried it several times, but it, it, it wouldn't, it didn't like us. Yes, you'd have to have it too cold and too hot. Conservatory that was kept cool or something like that. Which one was that? What? Nasturtium? Climbing nasturtium? Tro no? Tropiolum. Oh, incisum? No, can't think. Okay. But, it, but it's scarlet. You can get the seeds quite easily in seed companies from Britain, um, but it really doesn't flower the first year. And if you I, have did, I did Britain, grow the yellowish one, but that didn't last. That was supposed to be more hardy. If you have relatives in Victoria or Vancouver, give it to them. It might do well yes. for them. Hmm. I have a question about um, bloodroot. Do they generally seed themselves around in the garden? I have a little patch up near the house, about 15 feet up from the house. And two plants showed up at the very back of my garden in an area that's almost completely shaded by overhanging cedars. And the neighbor has a Norway maple in, on the back backyard behind me. In very dry uh, shaded soil, uh, two huge hepatica leaves, and one of them had a double flower. Wow. This spring. And, and about like 30, 35 feet from the other patch, they just showed up. Lovely. So I, oh, I was kind of amazed. Ants will take the seeds and they will sell, they will self seed, but was it a true double? Because the usual double blood roots are all one clone that was found in 1928 or something like that. So every single well, double blood root is, is apparently related to every other double blood root. I didn't think that I had any double blood root in the other patch and I haven't really looked that closely at it this spring, but this was a double. It was like a frin fringy, fringy, frilly flower. It was not frilly, but fringy, you know, many. Oh, terrific. Many, so, so narrow, don't lose it. One of the problems is digging up 
a few double blood roots that will be in the plant share. Who is? Um, but Anna's quite right. It's, it's hard to get hold of, and it's all descendants of one clone, unless Heather has managed to uh, generate a second, in which case she'll go down yeah. into history. I, uh, I doubt it. I may have another one in the garden. I, I just haven't checked. If you all want to learn a new word, mermecary is uh, the, it comes from mermex, which is Greek for kind of ant, um, and being carried about by ants. So if you put little bits of yummy stuff on your seeds, ants will come along and collect it because of the yummy stuff on the seeds. They'll take it back to their nests, carefully bury it under the ground for you, and then your seed will sprout there. And uh, bloodroot will do that. Some violets will do that. Around the world, it's something that's evolved independently many, many different times. So quite interesting. Hmm. This is a well, it was one patch and my 200 foot long lot spread to the whole lot through the beneficial. Can you, can you, can you repeat what the name? Because you, you've been going in and out a bit, Clement. Oh, you, type it the in. word, the word. Nemer. Mexicori. Can't get it. All working at a, a church. Put it on chat. Oh no, it just started. Uh, it's in the chat now. Oh, oh, oh here. Mermicori. Mermicori. M y r m e c h o r y. And there's variations on that. You know, botanists love to make up long combinations oh, well. of Greek words, but. Um, Volunteers from this organization went. When your when your orchid drips little sweet drops up, another adaptation there to invite the ants up. So, so uh, let's ant adaptation. I have another anomaly in my garden last summer, and um, a mullion a mullion sprouted out of the asphalt a crack in the asphalt <laughs> just behind my house anyway it grew to eight feet we finally got around to measuring it last week when i had a friend over who was six feet tall and stood beside the dried out skeleton of this plant which i still mean to take a picture of and he happened to have a tape measure with him, and uh, we measured it was eight feet, and it spurted out of a crack in the asphalt. Yeah. So yeah. the power of native plants is amazing. I, I was at St. Louis among the Hurons for a, um, a training session, and we did a, a hike with a, a native guide in the, at the night, and he led us all with a torch, and his torch was a perhaps not as much as eight feet, probably about two meters. It was a mullen, dead mullen, and it had been soaked in fat for the top end and set alight. So it made oh, a very wow. smoky but a wonderful torch. Oh wow! <laughs> yeah, this thing had about ten candles on the top, eight to ten candles on the top. What does it do? spikes. It was just incredible. I'm, I'm going to try and regrow it from seed. And the end of the month, yeah, when you wake up, in a big So it's 10 minutes past nine. I'm, I'm going to ask Ron if he has any words. <laughs> um, just basically to thank everybody for joining us uh, for this season. Um, once again, uh, we have not been able to meet in person. Um, hopefully we do that at some point. Uh, we're going to be taking some time off this summer, but we will still be available. We'll be on Facebook. We'll be on Twitter. We will be on Instagram. Uh, of course, visit our website, www.parkdaletorontoward.com, and definitely communicate with us with any, any ideas or any concerns or anything of that matter, and we'll try to uh, reply to you as promptly as possible. Okay, so once again, thank you so much, and we'll see you online in the fall, maybe in person. I don't know how it's going to go, but <laughs> we will see you this fall in September.
Ron, don't forget to send me that information regarding St. George's, the, the woman's name and number. I will do that. And, and email. Thank you so much. And thanks You're for welcome. those pictures. You're mm. welcome. Have a great, have a great everyone. summer, everyone. Good night, everyone. Bye. Stay Bye. safe. Bye. Get your next vaccines. Bye-bye.